Chemistry lecture number 36, properties of ionic compounds and metals. Ionic compounds are made of anions, negative ions, and cations, positive ions. The compound sticks together because opposite charges attract each other, and then conversely, similar charges repel each other. Table salt or sodium chloride, NaCl, is composed of Na plus and Cl negative. The ions in salt are arranged in an orderly pattern of alternating sodium ions and chlorine ions. And this pattern allows the opposite charges to be in contact with each other. So here's a picture or a diagram of, uh, of uh, sodium ions and chlorine ions. So they alternate sodium chlorine, sodium chlorine. And when you alternate them in this fashion, uh, it positions the ions of that, it tends to be in between ions of opposite charge. So the sodium with positive charge is in between chlorine of negative charge. Uh, the chlorine of negative charge is in between sodium of positive charge. And this gives you a stable structure where the ions are in close contact with as many other ions that it's attracted to as possible. Now the previous picture showed a two-dimensional diagram of alternating positive and negative ions. NaCl exists as a three-dimensional structure. So here's a picture showing alternating ions and cations in a three-dimensional structure. All right. So <clears throat> the green ones are the positive ones and the negative ones are, I'm sorry, the green ones are the negative ones and the red ones are the positive ones. So it alternates, you know, negative, positive, uh, negative, positive, negative, positive. Notice that the chlorine is drawn bigger because the uh, negative ions are always a little bit bigger. Okay. And the structure is shaped like a cube. Uh, the NaCl ions form millions of cubes which are all stacked on top of each other. And this stack of cubes creates one gigantic cube which we see as a salt crystal. And I'm going to show you a picture of a salt crystal in just a second, but you can see that this is a, a cubic shape. So, you know, oops, like that. So it just forms a gigantic cube. And then what happens is the cubes uh, sort of pile up on top of each other. So it's a cubic shape. And then on top of one cube, another cube is formed. And then another cube uh, is put on top of that. And eventually what you get is uh, a gigantic cube. Okay. So when you stack one cube on top of another cube on top of another cube, you get a big cube. And uh, when we see this big cube, you'll see it as a, a crystal. So I'm going to show you a picture of what salt crystals look like under a microscope. So notice it has a sort of a boxy cubic shape. That's because all the individual tiny atomic level uh, cubes are stacked on top of each other and they make one great big cube. The NaCl ions uh, have formed something called a crystal lattice. A crystal lattice is a three-dimensional geometric arrangement of particles. Each positive ion is surrounded by negative ions, and each negative ion is surrounded by positive ions. Uh, the ions in an ionic compound are arranged in a crystal lattice. The crystal lattice gives ionic compounds <coughs> excuse me, certain properties. Uh, first, ionic compounds have a high melting point and a high boiling point. And the electrostatic attraction between the anions and cations is strong, and it takes a lot of energy to break the ionic bonds to separate the ions. So that's why the melting point, the boiling point, is so high. Metals don't uh, boil very easily. Does salt melt when you put it in a frying pan? Nope. Salt is an ionic compound with a high melting point. So the reason why salt doesn't melt when you throw it in a frying pan and heat it is the, uh, the bond between the positive ions and negative ions is so strong, it takes extreme volcanic temperatures to get them to uh, liquefy. All right, next, ionic compounds are hard and brittle. Uh, ionic compounds are hard because the positive and negative ions are strongly attracted to each other and difficult to separate. However, when pressure is applied to an ionic crystal, ions of like charge may be forced closer to each other. The electrostatic propulsion can be enough to split the crystal, which is why ionic solids are brittle. So the next picture shows how layers of a crystal can be realigned to cause repulsion between identical charges. So let's say you have some crystal like a salt crystal, and you give it a good whack. And uh, what happens when you hit a crystal of salt is that it breaks apart. 
Why does it break apart so easily when you apply uh, some pressure? Well, here's what the uh, crystal would look like before you give it a sharp blow. You have alternating positive and negative charges and they're all attracted to each other. When you give it a blow, uh, let's say this layer will temporarily move out of alignment. And when it moves out of alignment, instead of negative charge being next to a positive charge, now the negative charge is going to be placed next to another negative charge. Okay, so all right, here's a positive charge right here next to a negative charge. When it gets hit, it moves down, and then it'll be next to this positive charge. So you have similar charges next to each other <coughs> next to each other now, and if they have similar charges, there's going to be a force of repulsion. So that's why ionic compounds are brittle. Uh, when you hit them, you'll move the layers out of alignment, and it'll cause repulsion between the ions. Now, if you do manage to apply enough heat to uh, melt an ionic solid, uh, it's capable of conducting electricity. And electricity can be thought of as a flow of either positive charge or negative charge. Uh, ionic compounds in the molten state are electrical conductors because ions are free to move. Ions dissolved in water are also free to move. And thus, ionic compounds dissolved in water also conduct electricity. Now, in the solid state, however, ionic compounds do not conduct electricity. In a solid, the ions are held rigidly in a fixed position, so they cannot move, thus prohibiting the flow of electricity. Compounds that do not conduct electricity are called insulators. So let's draw a picture of uh, what we've been talking about here. In a solid, um, the ions, you know, you have these alternating positive and negative charges. Uh, they're not going to want to move. They're in a fixed position. Uh, the negative is going to be attracted here to the positives that are surrounding it. So it's fixed. The negative charge isn't going to move and the positive charge isn't going to move. Now, if you heat it enough to break the bonds and make it so that um, the ions can flow around, you can have an electric current uh, because by definition, an electric current is the flow of positive or negative charge. So you apply a battery and you can attract the negative charges towards the bottom, positive terminal of the uh, battery and then the positive ions will be attracted to the negative terminal of the battery and when you have this attraction and uh, flow of charge, you have electricity. So the basic conclusion is that uh, ionic compounds conduct electricity only in the molten or an aqueous uh, solution. <clears throat> Metals, however, are solids that can conduct electricity. And this is due to the nature of metallic bonding. Uh, metallic bonding occurs when loosely held valence electrons of metal atoms move freely from one metal atom to another. So in a metal, the valence electrons are held very loosely. They could just leave the atom and just move from one atom to another. So this moving sea of negative electrons acts like a glue that holds the positive nuclei of the atoms together. So this little negative charge here, or this little dot here represents the negative charge of an electron, and it shows that the electrons just kind of move randomly from one positive nuclei to another. So in metals, um, the nuclei have a hard time holding on to the negative electrons. The electrons just swarm and move all over the place, and it produces what they call a sea of moving electrons. Here's another picture. The little pink dots right here are the electrons, and the electrons move from nuclei to nuclei so rapidly that it's like a sea or a swarm of delocalized electrons. And when they move around like this, it binds uh, all these positive nuclei together. As long as there are negative electrons in between the positive nuclei, it's going to cause it all to congeal and stick together because the uh, positive charge of the nuclei is going to be attracted to the negative electron and then this positive nuclei is going to be attracted to this negative electron. So the swarm of moving electrons kind of acts like a glue holding all these nuclei together. So. Metals conduct electricity because the electrons move freely from one nucleus to another. Uh, mobile electrons can also transmit heat from one place to another. Consequently, metals can also conduct heat. Now, these mobile electrons are also called delocalized electrons. Uh, delocalized electrons interact with photons by absorbing and releasing their energy. And we observe this uh, absorption and release of photons when we see metals reflect light. When metals reflect light, we are seeing the release of visible photons. Thus, metals are also shiny and reflect light. So this uh, 
ability of the electrons to move freely in a metal framework uh, allows it to interact with photons and the interaction with photons uh, causes the metal to have a shiny appearance, to reflect light, so to speak. And finally, uh, metallic bonding makes metals malleable and ductile. When something's ductile, that means that a substance can be drawn into a thin wire. Malleable means that a substance can be hammered into thin sheets without breaking. And this is the opposite of being brittle. A flattened penny is an example of the malleability of a metal. So. There's a flattened penny. They have those machines at amusement parks where you uh, put your penny in the machine and 50 cents and what the machine will do is it'll uh, hammer or not necessarily hammer but it'll apply great pressure through some rollers and it'll flatten out the penny. All right? So you can only do that with something that's malleable. If you were to put a salt crystal in the machine, uh, the crystal would break into a whole bunch of little pieces. All right? and here's another one. This is a flattened quarter. All right? Example of malleability. You can apply pressure on the surface of it and it'll just flatten it out. It won't cause it to uh, crack. Metallic bonding makes uh, metals malleable and ductile because the moving electrons are in continuous contact with the metal nuclei. Putting stress on the metal by hammering or pulling on it will not separate the negative electrons from the positive nuclei. In this way, the attraction between ions is preserved. So here's a picture of a uh, piece of metal being hammered <coughs> and you notice that unlike the other photo where when you hit it, it moves things out of alignment. Uh, when you hit a piece of metal, uh, the electrons just move around and continue to uh, maintain contact with the uh, positive nuclei. So in contrast, here's a uh, ionic compound, you hit it, the uh, positive ions move out of alignment and then now the positive ions are next to positive ions and the negative ions are uh, placed closer to negative ions and away from the uh, positive ions. But with a metal where the electrons are just constantly moving, uh, they're always going to be in between the positive nuclei. And if the electrons are always going to be in between the positive nuclei, even if you hit it, it's not going to cause things to split apart. The electrons, uh, you can think of it as like hammering glue. Uh, it's still going to be sticky. It's still going to cause these things to stick together. So that's why when you hit a piece of metal, it doesn't shatter. The electrons just keep on moving and act as a binding agent holding all the uh, positive nuclei together. For a PDF transcript of this lecture, go to www.richardlouis.com. This has been chemistry lecture number 36, Properties of Ionic Compounds and Metals.